Uh, this month, we are uh, collecting funds for the Operation Christmas Child mission. Of course, that's where we pack the shoe boxes, uh, Franklin Graham's ministry through uh, his Samaritan's Purse. And again, thank you to all who have brought things in during the year. Each month, we have um, set aside a particular item that we need, and we've collected a lot of what is necessary to fill the 200 boxes. That is our target. And so that will be this month, and I'll say a little more about it in the announcements. Uh, next month, we will reach out to the local missions, the Baltimore Rescue Mission, the Helping Up Mission, and the Women of Worth, all uh, organizations that meet people right where they are, most of them on the street. And uh, they've all been around a long time, and they have all do uh, a terrific job. The gospel is first and foremost in what they do, and so again, we, uh, we try to reach out to them uh, every year as well. In November, our missions outreach will be to India. Uh, and as I've stated probably many times already, we do it before Christmas, primarily because one of the missions is uh, Bharat Bible School in uh, central India, Hyderabad. And Dr. Sam Baraga takes his seminary students out and they blitz the villages and the communities in the area with the gospel. So we like to provide for them prior to that. So keep them in your prayer. They've faced a lot of persecution in recent years. Um, severe beatings by the Hindus as well as the Muslims. Uh, cars and homes set on fire. Uh, you know, the devil, the worldwide, will do whatever he can to stop the spread of the gospel. Uh, but it continues on. And so we pray for the faithful people uh, who would work the front lines, uh, again, like Dr. Baraga's students have been doing for so many years. And then in December, we are reaching out to uh, a ministry that we've supported uh, through the years, as well as a new one, uh, the Rendley Ministry in Kenya. Uh, Judith Collins has overseen that for over 50 years. Judith, in the past year, has had um, a very bad stroke and heart attack. Uh, she is um, convalescing at this point. Uh, we pray the Lord will get her back up on her feet. She has lost the ability to speak. And so these are important things, obviously, for a frontline missionary. But the work continues in her, what we hope is just an abbreviated absence, but the work will continue. So we continue to raise funds for that outreach uh, over uh, near Nairobi, Kenya. And the new one that we're reaching out to is called SAT, S-A-T-7, and that is Satellite TV, and it is coming out of the Middle East, and it reaches into Turkey uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, and the gospel is preached and taught uh, a lot of it to children. So if you're familiar with um, what we have on this side of the world, uh, Veggie Tales, if you all have kids or grandkids, I'm sure you've seen Veggie Tales. Something similar to that is what they do for the children on their TV programming, and they do it in three languages, Arabic, Farsi, and uh, Turkish. And so, again, many people are coming to the Lord through that. We have a, a soft spot anyway for radio and TV broadcasting. We've been uh, doing the radio side of that for decades, and uh, we know the Lord can reach people through those airwaves where physically we often cannot go. And so uh, keep those in mind uh, if the Lord uh, moves you to support our missions. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you again for the day that we have before us. You have awakened us, Lord, and so we look forward to what opportunities there will be whereby we can share the gospel message. Let others know what you have done for us. It really is as simple as that, Lord. People are hurting everywhere. And if we can keep a smile on our face and let them know 
that uh, they need to know what we know. They need to know you. They need to know that you uh, love them and you are there um, to, uh, to offer a healing, not just physical, not just mental or emotional, but the most important being a spiritual healing, bringing them to salvation. And so, Lord, again, give us the opportunities, maybe more importantly, open our eyes to the ones that are there because we do miss so many of them. And uh, bless our efforts, Lord. Thank you for your blessings that uh, come our way every day. Forgive us, Lord, for overlooking them. Forgive us for taking them for granted. Uh, but, Lord, everything comes from you. And we, we know that, and, uh, and we appreciate that, and we want to thank you for that. Lord, we ask a special blessing on those who are with us today and maybe not uh, feeling so well. I know there are many who watch us online. Uh, there are some who uh, cannot be here today. Uh, actually, their their neighborhood is closed downtown because of a bicycle race, and so we pray, Lord, that uh, they may be able to watch us online. Uh, we also think of our sister Susan, um, who is uh, battling uh, an issue right now, respiratory issue, and we would pray, Lord, that you would touch her and heal her, uh, Father, and make her whole again. And any, Lord, who we have in our bulletin, any of those that we don't have listed, but you know who they all are, Lord, and uh, we just want you to know that we lift them up in prayer, and uh, we ask for your healing, Lord, uh, as only you can heal, and we we thank you, Father. We all have unsaved loved ones. We pray for their salvation. If there are any here today, Lord, who do not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would uh, trouble them until they uh, admit to you that they're a sinner and they ask you to forgive their sins. And Lord, we know that's the only way we get into heaven is to have our sins forgiven. So Lord, we have so many things and so many people to pray for, uh, for our nation for the missionaries who are uh, scattered around the world, Lord. You, uh, you take care of so much, Lord, but then again, we know that you are, you are God Almighty. You're our sovereign God, and you do providentially rule your universe and all that is in it. And so, Lord, we, we thank uh, Jesus for the work done on the cross that the temple curtain was torn in half, and we do have this access to you now through the power of prayer. And uh, Lord, we're just such a blessed people in so many ways. Uh, continue to bless us and to use us as you see fit as we set aside our will and seek thine will for our life, our church's life, Lord, as we move forward. We ask it all in Christ's precious name. Amen. Uh, welcome to everyone as I... Uh, Look around and see all the familiar faces, a lot of them with smiles. Always good to see a smile. There you go. Uh, so welcome back. God bless you all. Uh, again, the visitor's card, it's obvious that um, you may not be a visitor or first-time visitor, but use the back of the card, as many have done with a prayer request if you have one, and we will certainly uh, lift that request up in prayer to the Lord for you. Ladies' Bible study is this Thursday at 7.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, if uh, You can come a half an hour earlier, and that's open to anybody, men and women alike, for a time of prayer at 7. Uh, we would encourage you to do that. We do. Next weekend is maybe the busiest weekend we've had here in a long, long time. Um, Saturday, we have... Um, our free crabs and more picnic. We're billing it as crabs and more because we're bringing in uh, a bushel of crabs. So if you like crabs, uh, come and join us. Otherwise, we'll have all the normal picnic fare for you. Um, if you would, though, so we know how many to expect, there is um, a sheet, two sheets, I think, on the events board downstairs. Sign your name. And if you're able to bring a dish, again, so we don't duplicate uh, a lot of side dishes. We we will supply things like corn on the cob and hot dogs and hamburgers, but we're looking for salads, things like that, uh, maybe a dessert, 
Anybody might be partial to blueberry pie or something. Whatever you want to bring. And uh, <laughs> look at my brother, Greg. He's, uh, he likes blueberries, too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but come and join us, please. It's from 1 to 5. If the weather is bad, we will do it in the fellowship hall. We will have the picnic one way or the other because the crabs are on their way. So please come and join us. The very next day, Sunday, is our monthly luncheon. Uh, you might see some leftovers that day. I don't know. But we, again, encourage you to bring a dish if you can and join us. Come for a time of fellowship uh, around the table. And then Monday is our God and Country service. Uh, we have every 9-11. This year, Bill Federer will be back. He hasn't been here in a few years. He's looking forward to joining us. So please come out, bring a friend. Again, it will be outside, weather permitting. If not, it will be right here in the sanctuary. One way or the other, uh, we will have that. So next weekend, we'll be, uh, be very busy. Uh, maybe you all take Tuesday off and sleep. I don't know. But uh, we'll see how that works. We also are collecting. If you uh, came in, but I guess the way most of us do, up the steps, you saw a Christmas tree in the corner with some gifts under it. Uh, we do that every September because we are collecting what we call WOW, W-O-W, gifts for the children. It's kind of a, a, a toy thing, something they can play with. They're, they're getting the other uh, the things that are necessary, the toothbrushes and the wash rags and the soap, things like that. But, but these are things they can, they can play with because uh, a lot of the, these kids are very young, elementary school age up to what is it? Is it 14? 14 is the oldest. Um, so if you can bring a gift like that, put it under the tree. We don't have the, the green bin out there this month, so put it under the tree. Um, keep in mind, it has to fit in the shoebox. So uh, if you're going to bring a football, deflate it and bring a little pump or whatever might be necessary. Uh, no liquids. They can't have liquids in there. Uh, and uh, no weapons, real or otherwise. Um, we don't want to be having the six-year-olds going around with even a water pistol. So keep those things in mind. And uh, that is going to be through the month of September. I think I included everything on that. Looking for confirmation? Okay, thank you. The uh, other things that are on here, we do have another website in addition to our church's website. It is godseternallife.org. It's listed in your bulletin. It is a work in progress. We are still adding things to it. So take a look at it, and if you have some suggestions, let us know. Let us know if you like it or you don't like it. And um, as I said, we will continue to, to add some things to that. The September uh, defenders are in the back, and I do believe everyone who is here should have gotten an invitation by now to our um, anniversary We'll call it a luncheon because it's from 11 to 3. It is a free gift from the church to all of you. Please come and join us at Friendly Farm. That will be on Saturday, September 23rd. So what's that, three weeks from yesterday. Uh, please come out and join us, and uh, we trust the Lord will bless our time together. I think that is all I have. Brother Joe, thank you. This morning's scripture reading is from John chapter 1, verse 29, and also from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Please stand for the reading of God's word. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And then we turn to Revelation chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. And this is John speaking again. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open 
and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Please be seated. Now Pastor Dave will bless us with the message, The Lamb and the Lion. The lamb and the lion, or the lion and the lamb, either way works. Just so we properly understand the meaning of those terms, lamb and lion, that uh, Joe read for us in our text, when John the baptizer publicly announced, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, Every Jew, within the sound of his voice, knew what that meant. Now, they may not all have believed it, but they understood the meaning of it. In Exodus 29, 39, we're told that every morning and every evening, a lamb was to be sacrificed in the temple. And it was done so for the sins of the people. And then we read in Isaiah 53, verse 7, that the Messiah would one day be led like a lamb to slaughter. Because to pay the penalty for sin, a life had to be given. Blood had to be shed. And God chose to provide that perfect sacrifice in Christ, who cleanses us eternally from sin. Once and for all, that sacrifice was made. Not every day, like the sacrifice in the temple. And obviously, we will celebrate that at the communion table in a little bit. The lion, which is Jesus at his second coming, his second advent, symbolizes Jesus's authority and his power. Christ the lion will lead the battle where Satan is finally defeated and cast into the lake of fire. We read that in Revelation 19, verse 20. Christ the lion is victorious, though, because of what Christ the lamb has already done. Now, we have a problem today that's been around for 2,000 years. It's called misinterpreting Scripture. And by misinterpreting Bible prophecy, many people 2,000 years ago missed the lamb. They missed the lamb because they were looking for the lion, the lion of Judah. In fact, the entire Jewish religion today, minus some who we refer to as Messianic Jews. They believe that the Messiah has already come. But most Jewish people are still missing him. The Lamb of God is Jesus. The Apostle John referred to Christ this way in our text when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the lamb. He's the lamb that God would give as a sacrifice. And not just for Israel, <clears throat> excuse me, but for the whole world as well. For God so loved the world. You know John 3.16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. So history and prophecy are linked in this metaphor of a lamb. Now, as we stated at the beginning of this, John's reference to Jesus as the Lamb of God recalls for us the Old Testament system of sacrifice. In this sacrifice, God accepted the blood of animals as the means of atonement for the people's sin. 
It's a reference that every Jew, young and old, would know about immediately. Remember, back then, theirs was a culture of death. The civil laws were not friendly to the common folk back then. People were put to death routinely for a host of infractions. Life was cheap. It was not sacred at all in pagan societies. And yes, you might argue that in America today, we have a society that's very pagan in its nature. People do not believe in the sanctity of life. We give you the Exhibit A, of course, which is about 65 million babies aborted. As 21st century Americans, I think we might also draw an analogy to the wild, wild west of the 1800s, where in places like Dodge City and Tombstone, they were ruled by who? They were ruled by the one with the quickest gun. And he was only in charge until someone quicker came along. They didn't last very long back then. Staying out of sight, keeping your mouth shut, usually increased your chances of living a longer life. And just as blood flowed so easily in the Wild West, it did the same in the Roman Empire. Now, couple of that with the fact that the Israelites lived under a justice system which included animal sacrifice. So the smell of blood must have been in their nostrils morning, noon, and night. Did you ever smell blood? Lots of blood. Have you been to a slaughterhouse? It is not very pleasant, the smell of blood. But it was everywhere back then. So my point here, again to reiterate from what we said earlier, is that the Jewish people would have known exactly what John meant when he referred to Jesus as a lamb. This is what the Jewish people did with lambs. John was proclaiming publicly the identity and the mission of Jesus. He was referring to Christ specifically in sacrificial terms. And again, hardly misunderstood by the folks. As the divine lamb, Jesus had to undertake on behalf of humanity, that includes you and it includes me, the task that was performed by the very first sacrificial Passover lambs. We go back to when the Jews were still in bondage in Egypt. They were saved from the angel of death through the lamb's blood. The sacrificial lamb was slain and its blood was put on the, the doorposts of their homes so that the angel would pass over them. The angel of death saw the blood, the sacrificial blood, and did not visit those homes. They were able to live. Well, Christ's mission was to pay the penalty for sin, shedding his blood on the cross as the atonement for mankind. The strongest image that we see of this in the Old Testament is that of the suffering servant who was led as a lamb to the slaughter and who bore the sins of many. And we read about that, of course, in Isaiah 53. Unfortunately, many Jewish people today, and in fact, for the last 2,700 years since Isaiah wrote that prophecy, they have not paid much attention to Isaiah chapter 53. And there's a reason for that. The reason is they weren't looking for the Lamb of God. They were looking for the Lion of Judah. But the Lion of Judah is also Jesus. Most Jewish people will not get that specific, though. 
they will call him Messiah, which of course is what and who he is, but they don't recognize yet Jesus as being the fulfillment of that prophecy. The time will come when many of them will. Praise the Lord. The Lion of Judah is who they were expecting at that time. Why? They were shackled to the Roman Empire. They wanted to be free. Judah, of course, the fourth son of Jacob. And Jacob was the line through which the Messiah would come. The analogy of a lion signifies great strength. And you can believe it when I tell you, because the word is what has told me, when Jesus comes back at the end of the age, it will be in great strength. He will fulfill that prophecy. We read, or Joe did for us, in Revelation 5.5, 5, that during the Great Tribulation, the Lion of Judah, which is also known as the Root of David, is the only one strong enough, the only one worthy enough to break the seven seals, to open the scrolls, which will release the seven plagues. And of course, when he returns to the mount, the same mount from which he ascended back into heaven, the Mount of Olives, it will split in half. He will return with all of his saints, as Zechariah 14, verse 5 tells us. That's us. We're saints. All who have died trusting in Christ will return to earth with him. We will rule with him for a thousand years on this earth. In Revelation 19, we see this in greater detail. It tells of great armies of believers wearing white robes and riding white horses coming down out of heaven with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to defeat the devil and the false prophet at the battle that we know is called Armageddon. This is what the Jews were looking for 2,000 years ago when Jesus came to earth the first time as the Lamb of God. And I don't blame them. It's easy to want that, but they had missed the prophecies. They missed them because they had either overlooked the Scriptures or they had misinterpreted them. We talk a lot about those who misinterpret Scripture today. In fact, we sometimes have lessons on it on Wednesday night. It's important. It's important to get the Scriptures right. Don't misinterpret it. There are people out there who ignorantly or naively twist the Scripture, but there are people out there who have an agenda as well. And you have to call this out. Mark them, we're told, in the Gospels. Let people know if somebody is doing it the wrong way. Because there are people who, who don't know any better. They will easily follow that which is not true. But the Jews of Jesus' time were expecting their Messiah. They knew he would be coming one day. But again, they were looking for a knight in shining armor riding on a white horse to save them from the Romans, setting up his kingdom here on earth. Well, we know Jesus' kingdom isn't here, not yet. There's a passage in Daniel that is very clear that the time for that had not yet arrived 2,000 years ago. In Daniel 2, verse 44, the prophet is very clear in describing when that would happen. Daniel, you'll recall, was interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream in the verses that, re, uh, that precede verse 44. And in describing the fourth kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar, and that fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. Daniel said it would be divided. Its first reign 
would follow the Grecian Empire. But then afterwards, Rome would fall, only to return again in the latter days. So what is Daniel speaking of there? He's speaking of a revived Roman Empire. No one said you couldn't have an empire getting a do-over, if that's appropriate to say. They had their reign back then, and they will have their reign again. A lot of people believe that the formation of the European Union might have been a, a sign that that was starting to happen, the revival of the Roman Empire. And it may be. It has a ways to go, of course. It's not in its final form yet, but when it is, it will be ruled by ten kings. And Daniel saw this in his interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream as the ten toes on Nebuchadnezzar's image in that dream. It's also given to us in prophecy in Revelation 12, verse 3, as the ten horns on the beast. Now, we are without excuse. We have the complete Bible. The people in Jesus' day did not have the New Testament. But they knew that the Roman Empire, which was ruling over them, only had one king, not ten. Daniel 2.44 says, In the days of these ten kings, God will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And of course, he's speaking of the millennial kingdom of Christ, the Messiah, whom they were expecting back on that first Palm Sunday to ride into Jerusalem on a horse. But they were blinded to what was playing out before their eyes. He rode into town on a donkey, didn't he? Not associated usually with the rigors of war. But remember, during his first advent, he wasn't coming as the Lion of Judah. He was coming as the Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace, not a sword-wielding wielding warrior on horseback. But again, the people didn't see it. Their minds were filled with earthly ideas for their king. And it's the same problem we all have today, isn't it? <clears throat> Christians today trying to fix the world their way, not God's way. We don't have a better idea. God's way is the only way. But we think by electing Christians, or at least good people, who have Christian values and morals, that we will fix this country. Well, I truly believe this, that the only way we're going to fix this country is to get down on our knees and pray and seek God's forgiveness, period. Even then, I'm not sure it's not too late. This country needs to turn from its evil ways, and that includes us Christians. We are sinners too. We have the great example of Abraham and Sodom and Gomorrah. God said, find 50 righteous in the land. And of course, Abraham couldn't, and he whittled it all the way down to 10. So you get the point here. I'm not sure how many righteous people there are in America today. I don't know how many God's looking for. But well, we continue in our decline, don't we? So you have to wonder. It hasn't seemed to stop God from unleashing his judgment on America. And I believe he's been judging America for, well, I mean, if you're looking for a, a, a date or a landmark, you could certainly go back to the uh, destruction on 9-11. 2001, but there were a lot of things before that as well, if you want to delve into history. So I think he's been unleashing his judgment on us, but not his wrath. There's a big difference between his judgment and his wrath. 
we have been promised as believers in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 that we will miss his wrath. That will come during the great tribulation when he empties the plagues onto this world. I feel that, we, uh, that we're feeling some effects of his judgment, though. As you look around the country, look, look at the state of our government. Look even at the state of the church, in, the church in general. But again, our, our nation was never meant to be a Christian theocracy. And our churches were not meant to be social proving grounds. We have it all backwards. But that's what happens again when people try to make their religion for the here and now. Our religion is not for the here and now. Our religion is eternal. And because we're doing it the wrong way, we have our eyes focused on all the wrong things. I'm sure God's not happy with the unbelievers who are out there. But we don't expect them to be godly. Christians, on the other hand, should be and need to be. But look at what they're doing to the church. Just some examples in recent years. The Episcopal Church, ordaining homosexuals, the United Church of Christ. I grew up in that denomination. Thankfully, the Lord brought me out of it. They hand out condoms. The United Methodist Church marry same-sex couples. What are they doing? What are they thinking? Now, I know many of those churches are not filled with born-again believers, but we all get painted with the same brush, don't we? These are people who are not walking very closely with the Lord, at least not the Lord of the Bible. But remember this. People who want to live in sin will always recreate God in their own image. Their own image. That way they can justify their sinful behavior. The God of the Bible has set down the law. But to those who don't like following anybody's rules but their own, what do they do? They just change the law. I, I say this, it seems to me almost weekly, but read Romans 1, verse 18 to the end of the chapter. It's like reading today's newspaper or online version. Does anybody besides me read a paper newspaper anymore? A <laughs> couple hands. Hey, praise the Lord. It's still out there. And the reason that they change these things is because to them, truth is relative. Do what you want. Be tolerant of others, unless, of course, they're Christian. And that, I believe, is why the country is changing the way it is. And as quickly as it is, we're no longer following the rules. What's good for you might not be good for me, they'll tell you. They'll also say, but don't tell me how to live my life. So if people don't have any respect for God, how do we expect them to have any respect for each other? And in the process, of course, what is happening? We are losing our country. My challenge to you is to understand what is coming. Very easy to do that. Read the prophecies. There's still many that are yet unfulfilled. Every prophecy in the scripture will be fulfilled. A lot of them have been, but there are still some that are yet future. So read the prophecies. Know what to expect. Don't be like the religious rulers back in Jesus' day. Don't misinterpret scripture. You'll only be disappointed, just like they were. And I know it's not always easy to understand prophecy. That's why Bible studies are good. That's why reading through the Bible, not just once, when you get to the end, start over again. God will take you deeper into his word. There were two pictures, if you will, that were painted 
of Jesus for us in the scriptures by the prophets. As the Old Testament saints read about the coming Messiah, the perspective of the two prophecies was not easily understood. Now again, we're on this side of the cross. It is much easier for us to see it and understand it. But it was there if people were looking for it. Let me try to give you a visual. Imagine looking at a mountain range. Now you're going to have to head west on Route 70. Uh, but imagine looking at a mountain range that is off in the distance. Well, you'll, you'll have no trouble seeing the mountain tops. But you may not see the valley that goes between those mountain tops. And the farther away the mountains are, the closer the peaks appear to be. When in fact the distance that separates them may be great. People who then read these Messianic prophecies often saw two different people when reading the prophecies of Jesus. They saw him as two, they saw the Messiah as two different people. And they were not able to make the connection. They didn't consider that there could be just one Messiah coming in two different roles, but separated by a valley of time. We're still waiting for him to return. So we know it'll be at least 2,000 years plus. One picture depicted Jesus as a humble servant who would suffer for others while being rejected by his own. Again, that's the picture of the suffering servant that is written for us very clearly in Isaiah 53. The other picture we see of Jesus is of a conquering king with unlimited power who comes suddenly to this earth at the height of a global war. Again, which we now know is Armageddon. This is Jesus as the reigning Messiah. We read about that in Zechariah chapter 14 and the book of Revelation. Now, it's easy to see why this would be the more popular of the two prophecies. The two prophecies, though, presented the rabbis of their day with quite a paradox. Many theorized that there would be two messiahs. They couldn't understand how both prophecies could be represented in one person. So they assumed one would come to suffer as their spiritual deliverer, while the other would come to conquer Israel's enemies and be their political deliverer. So why were they willing to accept the one but not the other? Why were they yearning for the Lion of Judah but not the Lamb of God? Well, one of the main reasons is one that's very similar to the condition that men find themselves in today. They had degenerated in their own religious convictions to the point where they didn't think they were sinful. You've ever met anybody out there who doesn't think they sin? I'm, I'm not a bad person. I don't, I don't sin. I've heard Christians say they don't sin. They'll lie about other things, too. So why did they need a spiritual deliverer? They didn't think they did. There was nothing wrong with them. They were good people. Again, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? But here's the difference, and I'll close with this. 2,000 years ago, people were looking for that knight in shining armor but it wasn't yet his time to come. It was the Lamb of God who rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. And when he did not overthrow the Roman Empire, which is what they wanted, what did they do? They crucified him, murdered him, because he wasn't what they wanted him to be. Now, fast forward. To today, we find ourselves spiritually enlightened. You like that word? You're only enlightened if you have the Holy Spirit. 
that other light bulb that's shiny is a false light bulb. But it's out there. Many religions tell us that we can find divinity within ourselves. The Mormons, the New Agers, the Unitarian Universalists, just to name a few. There are many others. There's a cult. Everywhere you turn, you'll find a cult out there. The problem is we don't see ourselves as sinful. And so we're not even looking for a savior. Why do I need a savior? I haven't done anything wrong. And because of that, people today are going to miss the prophecy that Jesus gave us in Revelation 3, verse 3. And Peter and Paul reiterated it in 2 Peter 3, 10 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. Where it says, and I'm summing them all up, the Lord will return like a thief in the night. And no man knows when that will be. So what are we to do? We're to be vigilant, watchful, but above all else, be prepared. Whenever Jesus comes, whether it's at the end of the tribulation to judge the world, or whether he comes at the rapture to take home his church, or whether he comes to you in your sleep tonight, Make sure you're ready to meet him. Make sure you're trusting in him alone to forgive you your sins. As the Lamb of God, he went to the cross. He went there to pay the penalty for our sins. And if you're trusting in his finished work, you've been forgiven. That's step one. Step two is living and reigning with him as the line of Judah, forever. You will receive a glorified body, which will never die again. First, you will live here on earth with Jesus for a thousand years. Yes, we are coming back in our glorified bodies. Then we will live eternally with him in heaven above. So if you are a believer, you have a phenomenal future awaiting you. It was granted by the Lamb of God, and it will be guaranteed by the Lion of Judah. His name is Jesus, and he is Lord over all. Now let's remember what he did for us as the Lamb of God as we go into our communion service. As we do each time we are privileged with partaking of the Lord's Supper, we remind that it was Jesus who instituted this in the New Testament. And so we, on a monthly basis, take a few moments to look back and to commemorate his death on the cross, which was on our behalf. We also reaffirm our covenant privileges and our responsibility in the present life that we are living. And of course, we anticipate his future return. Jesus is with us today in spirit. He is spiritually present in the elements of the bread and cup, as we will ask in a moment to have them set apart for this use. He is not physically here. The bread will remain bread. The cup will remain cup as they are set apart. But they do become his body and blood spiritually. It's symbolic. We are able to enjoy fellowship with him as we feed upon him by faith in our hearts. And so we come here to enjoy communion with him and to receive his grace. We are fed, we are nourished, we are renewed, and we are strengthened. We ask also, as I mentioned earlier, the Lord to sanctify this bread and cup as it is set apart for this holy use. Again, by this sacrament, Christ and all of his benefits are applied and sealed up unto us. It is required in the scriptures. Paul was very clear in stating this 
that you be a sincere and accountable believer in Jesus Christ. Because whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of putting him on the cross. If you are an unbeliever, if you're a repentant believer, we ask that you do not participate in the meal. Instead, remain among us. Use this time to ask God to speak to your heart and give you understanding. Again, if you are a sincere believer, if you are accountable to Jesus alone and trusting in him alone for the forgiveness of your sins, we invite you to partake of the elements. Here are the promises of God to those who truly repent of their sins and trust in Christ. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, however, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do seek your forgiveness. We are trusting in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but we are still living in this skin, this sinful body. And Lord, we do fall on occasion. And so we ask you, to pick us up, Lord, to forgive us, to put us back on the journey that you have prepared for us, and to lead us, dear Lord, looking not at the world, but only unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, we are grateful that we can have this sacrament as given to us as a reminder, a remembrance of what Jesus did for us on the cross. So bless our time uh, in communion this morning, dear Lord, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. And we do the same. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we remember, as you tell us to do in your Bible, remember what happened on Calvary, Lord, and we know that our Lord and Savior shed his precious blood, and uh, Lord, we know many there thought he was defeated, but the thief on the cross did not. He believed and Lord, we believe too, and we thank you for that belief and that faith. And Lord, we just thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, we just pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same manner also, Jesus took the cup, and again, after having blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is the new covenant which is in my blood, which has been poured out for many for the remission of sins. Take and drink, and we do as well. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we are so grateful for all that you've done. You've taken care of everything. Lord, we, we thank you. The best way we can offer our thanks up to you is by sharing this gospel message with others. Letting them know what Jesus has done for the forgiveness of sins. So we thank you, Lord, for the reminder. Keep our eyes turned upon Jesus as we leave our sanctuary today and go back out into that world. The world in which we find ourselves, um, but we are not of it. Greater is he who is in us than is he who is in the world, and for that we are forever grateful. Bless us, dear Lord, as we depart. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.